Good morning, everyone. Mm -hmm. It's for me a personal honor to be here as the first speech of the day. Also to be back in this beautiful town, which I like so much and always return here. Uh, I'm really glad that I'm talking today about the uh, meaningful interaction and me meaningful narrativity because for many years uh, this is something I am talking about to my students when I teach, for example, multimedia or composition. And recently I can see that this is really now a topic for the video games. And I think this is something which really makes sense to pursue and to talk about. I'll just take this device and uh, I have a couple of words about myself. If you don't know me, uh, I am a, basically my original profession is a cello player. <laughs> and uh, of course, then I studied some composition and through some uh, interac interactive music, I basically became a programmer. And since 2002, I am in the game industry. We started CB Software with Lukash back in 2006, and we worked over. Uh, uh, I worked over 15 published games, and with CB we have also a couple of things which we published. And cur currently we are talking about uh, or working on a game called Someday You'll Return. You might have heard about that one. And uh, today my talk would be structured into two parts. I will be talking something about. Uh, basically a theory of interactivity, theory of uh, narration, how to structure that, how to design that. And then I will switch and show you uh, the things, how we do it, so you can see it on a, some kind of case study, so you see how, it, how to put all these kind of theoretic concepts into a praxis. Uh, I would like, without uh, further ado, start with the story. And this is kind of very old story, it's like five, uh, fifth century before uh, before Christ. Uh, it's about the two Greek artists, Farhasios and Zephxis. And you might know this story, it's basically two guys, two painters, artists, you know, so they are kind of quarreling who is better artist. And uh, Farhasios uh, uh, was kind of younger one and he was not the favorite. And Zephxis was very good craftsman, very good, very good painter. And what basically happened is that the Zephxis, he painted a bowl of, uh, of grapes. It was so realistic, so realistic that the birds came from the sky and started pecking at the grapes. That's what say Plinius, of course, it's a bit of an urban legend, of course. And Parhajos, he hid his painting behind the curtain, behind the veil. And uh, then Zephxis was really curious what happened, so he went and he tried to uncover the veil but it was the painting. So it was fooled. And uh, why I'm telling you this story, that apart from the fact that Parhajos won, uh, the story means that the interaction, the gesture of opening the curtain was finally the thing which completed the art. It would not exist if Zephxis didn't do it, if he would just you know, stand there and say, yeah, that's a nice painted curtain. But the fact that he tried to unveil it, this interaction, it made the art, it made the piece. And it will be a topic of our talk today because uh, for video games, they are not movies. They are not about kind of just observing something and the interaction is the most important aspect of the narration design. I'll start, I go a bit more to the present. I start with Richard Wagner. You probably know this guy. He did some operas, for example. and. Uh, He's important by the fact that he really tried to unify all art forms through the theater. So he built the theater, he buried the musicians so they didn't kind of intervene with the theatrical aspect of the, of the uh, theater play and uh, of the opera. And this is basically something very important for us because he never say, okay, the music is less important, the narration is less important, the, the scenography is less important. Everything was equally important to create one kind of connected piece. And this is something which, if we take one step, one step further, we can maybe call as a game, Kunstwerk, which means that we add also uh, controls to it, this interactivity. So if you look at this image, we can see that we do have a controller, we do have an art aspect, we have animations which are very important for conveying emotions and stuff like that. We have some writing, some scripts, we have some music and some audio design. So a lot of things you have to kind of consider if you want to 
put them into one kind of global concept and if you want to uh, create something which is meaningful. So what I'm saying is that my talk today is not about how to write a dialogue or how to light a scene and create something. I'm, I, I'm just talking about all of these aspects and it can be a bit overwhelming if we just think about that, how much, how many things we can uh, consider, how many things we should put to the, to the art. Uh, why do we need this? Uh, of course, as I'm writing here, the good and meaningful design needs to unify all the art aspects. And I'm just showing this image from The Last of Us game, which in my book is one of the best narratively designed games. If we just, you know, don't talk about the ending, which turns a bit into more to, uh, to action a game, but uh, the way how it's interactive and how it works narrative-wise is one of the prime aspects what we should look and kind of study and think about when we design our narrativity. So my answer, it's not the only answer, you can have your own answers, is that I propose you a meaning-driven design, so not having meanings as a kind of second thought, but starting from the meanings and then descend to various parts of the, of the uh, building of your game. So, uh, now comes this theoretical thing. I will talk to you a bit about the meanings and I think it's very important to think about the theory because there is a huge art of knowledge which is, you can study it for years and you can write books about that and you can read many books about that, which is called semiotics. And uh, when you start to go to down this rabbit hole, you can spend many years doing that. But I will give you some very short brief, and if it's kind of interesting for you, I could recommend you afterwards some books you can read about that. And we start with this little example. Uh, there is a dog. So everybody just close your eyes and picture some kind of dog. So you have five seconds for that. Okay, that's something like five seconds. And now, I think that each of you pictured something else and that's the problem because that's the dog is just a concept. And if we talk about it less kind of in a funny way, uh, there is a couple of models which deals with this problem that if I say dog to you, uh, you can basically picture something which, is, which comes from experience with dogs. Maybe you have your dog, so you immediately imagine your personal dog. Somebody else can imagine the, uh, or remember the, the time where a dog bit him so bad that he ended in the hospital. So there are so many things which can dog trigger in you. And uh, so if we look into this uh, Ogden and Richards triangle, we can see that the dog as a symbol can be either word or some kind of painting, some kind of, some kind of uh, drawing, as we can see, it's this, this symbol of the dog down. And... Of course, we can see that this symbol stands for some kind of referent, which is the dog itself. So this is the concrete dog, this is a photograph of dog. So if you see a photograph of dog, if there is dog just walking in front of you, you can immediately see it's a dog and there is no way to, uh, uh, no reason to explain this is a dog. This is a very common mistake in video games because you can see a dog and the main actor says, okay, it's a dog. So there is a, there's no reason to do it. And the problem is that the symbol reference, uh, symbolizes reference or thought. So when you sh I showed you this word dog, this is what happened basically. It symbolizes something which came from your memory. It's your personal experience with dogs and immediately triggers. Or maybe you haven't seen dog in your life because you live in some abandoned island somewhere and there are no dogs. So nothing comes out, which is another important concept I will be talking about a bit later. And of course, this thought refers again back to this real dog to this kind of walking animal uh, or it can refer to something totally en uh, else depending on your experience. If I take it a bit to uh, another, another level, I showed you Paris triad which is another kind of triangle how you can describe these things and uh, I just don't want to delve into this too much because the time is not that 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 favorite for my <laughs> favor in a favor for my talk. But what I wanted to show you specifically is a part which is called index. You can see a smoke, and when you see a smoke, it's index, and everybody of you probably see okay, there is a fire. You don't see the fire, nobody tells you there is a fire, but there is some kind of thing which signifies there is a fire. And these indexes or indices, to make a proper grammar, 
are something very important for a narration because the direct narration is very obvious. You know, you see a fire, okay, there's a fire. But you can make a lot of stuff by just using indices, just by pointing towards something which triggers your memory or tr triggers your experience and says, okay, there is a fire. Now the hard part starts because the problem is how we do process meanings. And so we see some kind of sign or we read about dog, we do this and this was exactly back reference to my example before. And the sign can be anything from visual, from audio sign, there can be sound, you can associate with something, there can be some words, there's some gestures, some animations. And some control scheme, for example, which is very powerful because we are doing interactive, interactive things. So we need to take in account that the control scheme itself is a meaning, meaning stuff. And we have some experience. We can't really actually much modify it. We just learn it through basically living. You know, you live, you experience some stuff, and it builds something which is some sort of paradigmatic layer. So it's this kind of part of your personality which filters any sign and translate this, uh, translates it to something which is your, and it's really culture dependent, context dependent, education dependent, so, so much different stuff is happening, so we are interpreting these signs in a certain way. And of course, it's being, if you are doing game, it's being distracted. And it's being distracted uh, in, two, in two ways, first is that at the beginning, if you have some kind of desire, you have some meaning you want to tell, it's the game is about something, you want to express some emotions, you can narrate some story, you can basically bring to players some frustration, for example, because you make a very hard game and you want them to feel frustrated, and then challenge, and then very happy, because all the endor endorphin is coming out when they finally beat the boss. So, uh, the desired meanings is something you have in your head, and of course, you have some of your personal context and experience. So maybe you're a hardcore gamer and you're able to beat uh, Bloodborne in two hours. And uh, so this is your context, this is your experience. And you have some constraints, so you have some ability. It's maybe your first game or you just, you know, are not skilled enough. You have some time because a publisher is pressing you to do it very fast. You have some budget, of course, that's one of the biggest limiting factors usually. And you have some technology because you would like to make a totally fully immersed VR game and you should have a brain implants for just movement and everything. So you don't have it now, so you are constrained. So you have this kind of uh, game and you throw it at the player and the second level of destruction begins. Because first of all, none of the game are really 100% polished, so there are some kind of quality or game issues which bring it back, you know, they, they put it down, they destroy the meanings. And of course, the most biggest or the biggest problem is the player's culture background or experience because the player is actually then uh, having a problem you know they, they have some background they don't understand your jokes they don't understand what's going on they maybe didn't play your game so they get a diff uh, or kind of similar games they are not in the same paradigm and of course uh, the third thing is the internal motivation why the player is actually playing your game and if this is not set properly if you kind of don't bring it on, his, uh, on your side, then you have another problem that your meanings are getting destroyed because something which you think is a very sad scene or very dark scene, and this happened to us uh, in one of our former games that I thought this is something really sad because I was so invested as an author with the characters, and what happened is that the player would laugh because they found it too melodramatic and whatever. So it really happens because they have a different motivation why they are playing your game. And the only thing how you can get it back is if you have a direct and direct feedback, which means you can have a play test, you, have, you can have a photo focus test to test these narrative aspects. And you can, you can have some kind of reviews and uh, YouTubers, so you have uh, streamers and, uh, and whatever. So you have a lot of feedback you should basically look at and learn from for your next, for your next game. So if we talk about meanings, I'm talking about three kind of meanings. For me, as a creator, this means that I'm doing a game. It's a really hard work. It's absolutely, you know, if you'd make a database system for a large company, it's absolutely trivial in comparison to make a silly game. So it's really, I have to have some reason why I'm not going for a beer and why I'm crunching at night and just, you know, hacking some code together. So there must be a meaning and I should really think about that and come down with what is the meaning, why I'm doing it. It's, you know, I'm not buying this, I like doing that. So there must be something deeper, and if you go deep, you can help your game a lot. 
the meaning for the player, which means that the player chooses your game for some reason. And there are all kinds of reasons, but you should kind of count with the, some kind of average approximate group. So what should this game bring for the player? And of course, and this is the hard one, for the virtual characters, because they should have a reason why they are in the game. And we are talking about narrative design now, so we are expecting there are some kind of characters. They could be anthropomorphic, they don't have to be anthropomorphic necessary, but they are there and they should have some meanings for them, you know, everything which happens in the world. And the problem is that we should create this kind of experience, this kind of context for all virtual characters we have in a similar way we have them, and I will show you later on how we are doing this through some kind of templates. So, uh, when we talk about meanings and the games, we first in our studio start by designing something we called internally a pyramid of meanings. And that's for the reason I showed you before on the slide of the context. If I just show you back a couple of slides and then I go back, which will be faster. Yeah. So, you can see that we are trying to reach the global market and that means a lot of culture differences, a lot of context, a lot of stuff. So, uh, how we know that it should work. And we start by the ground floor, which we called universally understood meanings. It means those are meanings which everybody can relate to. It's something which is common and it can be uh, something which uh, consider, in our case, for example, you are looking for a daughter who is running away from you. And that's something which everybody, even if they are not parents, can understand that father would probably go looking for his missing daughter and even the fact that she's not, you know, lost, she just, you know, keeps running away, makes some connection in your mind. Then we have a, a meanings which are relevant for target groups, so basically we kind of then think, okay, so who are our players who we really want to do the game to play? And that's another thing because uh, you should think about that. When you are doing narrative games, you shouldn't say, okay, everybody will play our game. That's not true. You're lying to yourself. So you should kind of think about this group and say, okay, so what this group knows, the kind of large audience, audience doesn't, and then bring in the meanings they could understand. Then we built a meanings which require a specific knowledge, education, and context. And as you can see, those are layers. So whoever comes and play your game, bring something from it and they don't have to necessarily understand everything and why we build it this way is that we really don't want to kind of gatekeep we don't want to say okay so if you don't if you didn't study lit literature you have nothing you know to do with our game just go elsewhere no we just say okay if you did study literature you find the little clues you find the little things which will help you to to progress or to proceed then we have a lot of secrets there, and they are decipherable, so they are more for the people who like to uh, basically uh, find, uh, find something and kind of make the connections. And again, it's not necessary to do it, but if you do it, you are rewarded, and that's the trick. So if you make it this way, then you have a lot of different and a lot of broad audience for that. Then we have Easter eggs, of course, and it's like a tip of the pyramid, and we put them because we like them, and there are some things which are is totally unnecessary to have there. So this is basically the mandatory part for us, and this is for us because we like it. And I have an uh, example of that. This is like an interpretation example. Imagine this is like a book from uh, Tristram Shandy, and if this book is lying, it's not in our game, but it, it was, would be lying in our game somewhere. The first thing is that you have to notice it's there and say, okay, Everybody say, okay, this person likes book, maybe books, and he likes to read if it's open. Then if you know this book, it tells you a bit about the character because it tells you, okay, this is actually a funny book, but it's also a book which requir requires kind of intellect. And it tells you a story about the character who is reading the book, if you know the book. And of course, there is a context, so you can find this book and it can be shrink-wrapped. And it's just, okay, so this character is probably a pose guy who just you know likes to show off that he reads uh, uh, he reads kind of uh, difficult books but he doesn't actually read them he just displays them for others to see so there are so many things you can do this and you don't need any words for that that's important you don't need words you just can put it there and it just brings the meaning by the uh, for the players who are observant and one thing i just wanted to mention and it's directly connected are so called negative or implied signs and those are signs which you expect they happen and they are not there. And if this is kind of well done, uh, 
it means that basically the observant player say, okay, why the character is not commenting on this obviously weird situation? Is it a bug in the game? And, but if you do it consistently, they find out, okay, there's something else going on just by basically excluding stuff from your game, which is cheaper than making it. So uh, it's left to players to discover, and if meaningful, we add a whole new layer of meanings by just doing this kind of negative implied signs. So if we make it short, I'll uh, talk about, about this meaningful game. So what we do is basically we start with meanings, we pair them with gameplay elements. That's one of the important things we start with, that we think, okay, what does it mean? And we basically think about all three kinds of meanings. What does it mean for us? What does it mean for a player? Or what should it mean for a player? And what does it mean for the characters in the game? So they react accordingly. So they don't kind of overact on something which is trivial uh, or just ignore the stuff which should be important for them. And it's a horrible thing. It's a really hard work to do that. So we have kind of three principles we are using. First is the selection, so we just basically select only a couple of things we want to work with. Then we do some kind of priority, so we say, okay, this is more important, this is less important, this is very good to do, because then you don't kind of m melt your game and don't just basically dilute it with some kind of, uh, with some kind of shallow stuff or uh, don't destroy the main meanings. And there is a restriction, and it should be okay, selection, restriction, they should like be opposite. But no, this is a restriction of the selection. So you select something, and they say, okay, but this is such a powerful thing, I'm using it only once. And I'll give you an example. Imagine I will be telling you a sad story, and we meet, and I say, okay, so, you know, my, my father died, and my mother died, and my dog died, and my house burned, my car got stolen, and, you know, I have this sickness, and whatever. And then as I go on, it turns into comedy. Because there's no longer sadness, I am I so overblown it with this kind of one kind of idea that you start laugh at the at the moment because it, it's really not not sad anymore because it's such a such an absurd kind of coincidence that you will not anymore be very sad about that. And we what we do is that we build this map of meanings and we assign impact value. So we say, okay, how much this is kind of powerful thing. And we, this is the way how we basically uh, decide how to work with individual values, how they are kind of hierarchized and so on. And another thing which we are doing is to mix uh, so-called centrifugal and centripetal elements. You can think about that uh, in a way that centrifugal is something which, is, which are going from the main themes, from the main meanings, and centripetal are going towards. And that's again the thing, you, don't, you want to avoid the game to be narratively kind of monothematic. And if you want to bring some contact, uh, contrast in the game, it's good sometimes to bring in all other elements just to put it a bit away from the main course. So if our game would be only about finding lost daughter, it would be very, very, very kind of monothematic and not very interesting. And if you are not careful about this all, we risk one thing and I'm going to show you a very, very, very known game. And I'm showing this game uh, as a prime example of Ludo narrative dissonance. What does it mean? Imagine this Nathan Drake, you know, in Uncharted game. He's a really handsome guy and he's very kind of very, very nice guy, you, you likable guy. But then he goes and he shoots, I don't know how, 100,000 people maybe in the heads. Just, you know, headshots are rewarded extra. So this guy is basically, uh, at one time, he's killing, brutally murdering, I don't know, 1,000 people. And then he said, oh, what a nice view there. And this is something which is really strange. It, I know this is kind of hyperbole and it belongs in this kind of genre, but, but in a way, it doesn't connect to the character and it's something you should think about. Okay, if I want to do this, if I want to bring this kind of absurd thing that is really a brutal serial killer and he has no consequence on his mind, you know, his soul is still intact, he's still, still this kind of boy who likes to explore secrets, but in the meantime, he just, you know, murdered a lot of people and took down a couple of tanks, then you should think about why you are doing that. And if we look at the uh, prime opposite, we have this ludonarrative harmony, which I call it, it's, or consonance, you can call it too. And this is where you basically expect that the players, or, or the NPC, or the playable character is behaving this way. And in Echo, you can see that this, this, this little boy is not murdering anyone. He's just, you know, very, uh, very roughly fending off the shadows, and he's all the time holding this, this princess. And it's like, it's like something you would expect. But if we go into something more brutal, if you look at blood, Bloodborne, there is no way you would expect your character in Bloodborne that he would behave in a different way. So I really 
like the the fact that it's so connected it's buried in this world which is kind of despair and I, I think this is very good example and of course for example journey is another example of that because uh, this character as a nomad with this kind of uh, rope with this kind of uh, scarf it's it doesn't matter if it's fantasy it doesn't matter if it's fairy tale what it what matters is that if you look at this, at, at this character you can feel the sadness you can feel all these elements they have there so at this point I would like to show you I will start if I conquer the PowerPoint I'll show you a short video from our game This was supposed to be easy. Just track her down again, bring her home. I had no idea how wrong I was, and how far I would really have to go. Search for the missing girl continues in the DVD. Please, tell me that she's safe. Your hysterics aren't helping. Stop calling me. a game we are now making, some deal return, and uh, I will start with the personal context of the game because we go way beyond the game borders in this. There are two regions in the Czech Republic where we have a, like a northern Bohemia and uh, a Khribi region of uh, southern Moravia, and the, re the regions are basically the regions of my and uh, Lukáš's childhood. We are two-man team doing this game, so basically this, we just split this and say, okay, where we grew up, what are our experiences, memories of the game. So you can see there are two places in, the, uh, in, the, in our country which we just basically took and used for the game. And here you can see that uh, we basically mix them. If you look at the photograph from the place there, from the Kazatelna place, it's a place where uh, St. Cyril and Methodius came in 9th century and just, you know, gave some talks there. So you can see that, uh, that this place is basically interpolated from the from the rock formation from the northern, Bo northern Bohemia and in our approach in our story driven game and meaning driven game and interactive interactive game sorry it's not a movie so that's what I just always need to stress we have a very personal way how to do it and we personalize it through ge geography which I just showed you and through paradigm which means that we just take our experience the memories but also the local legends, local folklore, music folklore, uh, narration for folklore stories and after this talk if you want I can tell you really some bizarre stories from the region. And we've, if we talk about the narration there we just use two types, they are direct and indirect. So direct narration is something that somebody is actually talking to you or just giving you some text and or you, you receive SMS or you just can phone call to someone you have uh, some radio where, where you can for example hear that the police is searching for the girl and uh, then of course we have indirect and those are more more important because those are the narration which player have to observe and if player observes that what happens is that they memorize it much more than if just they read 10, 10, 10 pages of texts of course animations they are so important so if you have for example some kind of shaky animation you can really express feelings without saying okay I feel bad because if the or, or if the character for example has a vertigo and you just visualize it through animations that he's really kind of moving uh, in, a, in a certain way it tells more than he say okay I have a vertigo 
Then there is, of course, audio narration and VFX narration, which is very important. So here you can, for example, see one example. This is like a, one of the first views you see in the game. And you immediately see a couple of things there. You can see the day of time which is there. You can see there is a fall. You can see uh, this kind of context that it's not abandoned. So the player doesn't have to con comment on any of these. You can see, OK, so probably cars were going here. A lot of stuff just by this view. There is no way why should player or NPC or PC comment on obvious stuff. Another thing is here, you see this kind of bridge and it's kind of shaky, you see it's not really complete. So whenever you step on it, the player doesn't need to say, okay, I should be careful stepping here because everybody can see it, you know. Everybody who has at least some basic understanding of how physics work, say, okay, this will not, probably not be easy to cross. So uh, when we started doing this design, like a systematic thing, we first kind of think, okay, let's make it interactive. So let's put down everything which happens in the game so you can see like a list of stuff which you can basically think about uh, and you, you can count to it when you when you build the game and then we say okay but let's be honest and let's write down what is not interactive and in our, in our case uh, dialogues are not interactive and this is something i would like to explain it was a very hard th thought about that because uh, you know for example if you have adventure games we are not really like an adventure game but but we kind of came from this background, they usually, they are some kind of dialogue trees and you orient through the trees and they are kind of puzzles because you have to talk about stuff and then there is some hidden path where you find something. So this one way and we hate this way because we think this is just an obstacle, it doesn't reflect on anything because then you have already some information and the dialogue trees are usually, you know, very, sh very shoddy in that. And then you have another option that you can have a really interactive dialogues and kind of with the consequences. So let's say, for example, from the, I don't quote Witcher 3, of course, because this is like a very prime example, but let's also say, uh, to talk about Heaven's Vault, where your choices really make impact on the whole game and on the gameplay. We're not able to do it in two people. So we've decided, let's have dialogues non-interactive, and they are just like a cutscenes, but they kind of don't fight with these meanings. And if you have a different context, you come from a different place there, then you are in a good position because we can play a different kind of di dialogue there. So it's like a non-interactive, but also can be more non-linear. And of course, some kind of short movie clips, we minimize these to minimum and some transitions. So for example, cam camera goes somewhere and back. And I'm mentioning this because in one of our first prototypes, we had this problem that there was a lot of examine spots that you could just, you know, zoom with the camera, then, you know, some comment and zoom back. And people were so angry because it was so slow. It was ju just dragging around. And the narration was going down the drain because, you know, it start the people when they start to be, uh, let's say, not very comfortable with the way how they control the game, and that's why I showed you that the control are integral part of the narration, then they basically have this problem, you know, then they, uh, those transitions can really destroy your narration in a way. And then I came with a system how to measure that, because I'm this kind of number guy myself, I really like numbers, I like to see, uh, see proof before I conclude something. So we started with intuition, so okay, let's just think about how those elements I just showed you have an impact. And first thing is that we are not a walking simulator, so the basic unit, of course, this is a game where you move in 3D, so you have to walk. You know? And you don't have a gun to shoot stuff, so we can't mend the gameplay by sending one wave of enemies after another to kind of make you feel interactive. No, we don't have that. So we just have this walking distance and we express it as a time. So let's say if I go from spot A to spot B, it takes me two minutes. So what it's so long time, you know, two minutes of non-interaction. So what we do is that we come, that each interaction there dilute the time and makes the game more interesting. And of course, from the intuition, we just observe people playing the game and we adapt the values. So we just say, okay, so this is less impact than we thought because we thought this would be interesting and they don't care about. So the critical part of interaction density measuring is to have a feedback, to have a play test, to have a focus test, to show it at the conventions and getting the feedback back, understanding what's, what's going on. And uh, right away you can see, is your gameplay vari variable enough? Is it, uh, or is it just, you know, 10,000 examine spots and nothing in between? So this is very hard to do with a traditional script. 
So, because you have this kind of, you know, this is kind of this movie script from Scrivener, I really love the software, but it's good for overviews, for kind of concepts, but it's not good for a game. So, and I say, okay, maybe there is some really expensive software, but I don't want to buy it. So I use Excel for that. And this is my system, which I want to present you today. And this is a system where I just have all these elements which is going on in the game so you can see that there is a and those impact values of these of these elements and then what you see here is a timeline how long it takes to reach certain part and then you just you know classify it you put what happens there so you put the numbers there so you right off right away see where your game you know is like two minutes without interaction and i'm talking about direct walk of course we have a lot of optional parts where you can go and find something but if you just you know are the, the 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 for us the worst player you just want to go the most most straight path you don't explore you're not interested in the world let's make it interesting even for you that's that's basically the concept of that again going back to universal pyramid of meanings it is direct consequence of that because we say okay even the, if the player just want to walk around and have it as fast as possible let's make it interesting and let's not count that he will just you know explore every nook and cranny and there he will find something interesting and uh, a last thing i wanted to talk about are emotions which are directly connected to that and i have a couple of tips for you First of, first of, uh, first one is it really pays off to track the whole emotional process for each scene. And by that, I mean that you don't, it doesn't, uh, doesn't, uh, it's not enough to say, okay, I want the player to be sad or, or angry or in love or whatever. I just want to understand exactly what is the process behind each emotions, why I want to reach and how I can reach them. So, in case if we, for example, have an NPC in the game, it's some kind of bidirectional and it can be symmetrical or asymmetri asymmetrical relation. So, let me give you an example for these horrible words. It means that you feel towards the NPC, NPC feels towards you. And it can be symmetrical, so you are both in love, or it can be asymmetrical, you can like the, the person and the person can hate you and stuff like that. So you think about that and you should look at, the, at these kind of scenes from both standpoints, from the standpoint of the PC, of the standpoint of, of NPC. And of course, that's the paradigm because they feel this way because of something. It shouldn't be that you meet some character and he hates you and even you as a creator don't know why. It, uh, just because to make it interesting. No, that's not how it works. You should really think about why, what, what, what happened, what was the cause. Because then it's hate and hate. It can be really hard hate and it can be just, you know, just, you don't, you don't, you're not sympathetic to the person. And the thing is when you design this, you can anticipate or identify problems very early on because you can see, okay, so I just now, you know, entered the scene before I killed 10,000 people. So I shouldn't probably be kind of just admiring the view or just telling some joke to an NPC because before something happened. And if we want to design emotions, we need two things, in my opinion. First is that we need to construct the previous life of a virtual person. And this is very important. And all virtual persons should have a constructed life. And another, which is even more important, is we should really make the player know the character. And this is very interesting kind of aspect because if you look at the games sometimes what happens is they try to make you care about characters too early and you don't care you don't connect enough so yeah why should they care about that so uh, so you need first to kind of act, make the exposition of the character make something which brings them on the stage and then you can make it and for example again if i go back to last of us they make it incredibly well because it was all, although it was very early on it was such a strong themes it worked with and such a strong gradation and this kind of antique way how to present the drama so they almost escaped at the very beginning and then you know the girl dies and that's something which are it's not random it's very carefully constructed very carefully designed so in my case again i go back to my Excellent, I had to erase all the, the cells so I don't spoil the game for you. But what happens here is if you have some kind of timeline here and you have some kind of, I filtered a couple of characters here, you just can write what happens in each year to the characters. And you construct this kind of virtual 
life of this person. So you take the important points of interest of these characters, and you just, you know, and then the example, there is the Stella was born in uh, this year, so you know exactly, also you can think, okay, what happened? It is like a contemporary drama. So uh, what happens at this year? You can go and think about what was the, what was the politics in, at this age and stuff like that. So you can bring all other stuff, but just by putting it in time. And uh, if you just, you know, fill this table, because in our case, this table is pretty, <laughs> pretty full already, and you have kind of all the characters there, you can basically very well reference it that there are no kind of inconsistencies, because you can very quickly reference if, you know, uh, Stella should be in this, you know, age capable of doing something. And this is what often, uh, you know, just escapes, eludes people when they are designing that, because they don't have this kind of overview. And another template I wanted to show you is, and this is the more complex one, is how we approach designing uh, the emotions. And in our case, uh, I have this kind of template, which is full of spoilers, but I just try to put away the main one. And it's also the outdated one, so it's no longer working that way, so that's why I'm showing it, this to you. So let's say each, each scene or each kind of interaction each, uh, with, with character over the course of the game has this kind of logic. We, I'm just always looking for the main emotion peak. So I'm saying, okay, what is the main emotion peak of this all interaction with some character? What is the kind of more powerful part? And then I think about that and I kind of come with a secondary emotion peaks, which are usually reversed to that. So if there is some kind of, the main emotion peak is that there is some kind of redemption or hate or something, whatever, then I come I, I always think about the fact what is the kind of secondary peaks where I can just say, okay, but it was not always like that. They are not that flat. What happens here too is that uh, uh, how basically uh, the characters together are attached when, when, is, when is the point where you, can, you, you are feel to share the stronger emotions. Which, because again, if you have a strong emotion, you should understand and you should tell players where it happens, where it can happen at the first time. You can again kind of omit the problem that it's too early and then it's lost. So if we, if we look at this template, we can see always that we have a, like a entry stance of those two characters. So it's like a one character, what is the original stance and uh, imagine that you're in the very scary forest and you meet a girl and she looks like she's okay there. There is a distrust because is, it, is she a monster or what, what she is? Why is she there? What, where, is, where are parents and whatever? And uh, on, the other hair, uh, on the other hand, there is an exit stance. So what's basically happening after the scene takes care? What do you want to achieve to, to the character? What should be his standpoint when this scene plays out? And uh, there are some kind of preconditions. So you just write down what's basically the what's basically the the preconditions and how the character feels the paradigm be just you can reference for example something from the past and stuff like that and we have these transitions so basically how they just change the stances and there is of course the curse of action so you just write what's what are the necessary steps to basically uh, ensure that the t target uh, transition is going on. So basically, if you look at this, it's much easier than just to read the dialogue, because when you write the dialogue afterwards, or read the dialogue and proofread the dialogue, or whatever you are doing with dialogues, you can basically reference that and say, okay, but maybe this is not really, you know, this is a, your idea how it should work, and this is how it actually is done, and it's not enough, or it's too much, or whatever. So this kind of things is uh, very good to have a uh, designed, which is, which is basically my, my uh, point of this whole talk. And I'm proposing you this method of meaning-driven design, so even behind the meanings and behind, the, behind all three kinds of meanings I was talk talking about before, uh, I'm just trying always to push the idea that you should know why. And it doesn't, you, do, you don't care if audience knows why, because you can put enough breadcrumbs for them to make this, but you as an author always should know why you are doing that. If you are putting scary things in the game, you should know why they are there. And I personally really don't like this thing. Okay, so let's say, okay, people are afraid of spiders, people are afraid of jump scares, people are afraid of, I don't know what, monsters, of, of darkness. So let's put these things and somebody will definitely catch. And if it's of course valid, design choice, but in my case it's not meaning driven, 
Because if I want to put a spider in the game, and it's kind of an, uh, something which is dangerous for you, it's because there is something which points to the fact that the spider could be there, and the character doesn't have a problem with spiders. So that's, that's something which you have to design. So if I'm just thinking about that, I'm always designing why I'm putting these things. And especially this becomes valid when there are paranormal things. So basically when, when there's something really strange, you know, that you saw in the trailer, the falling rocks, you know, out of the blue sky. You say, okay, what the bullshit. But it's not. If you play the game and you kind of start discovering what is going on, then you basically find out that everything there makes sense. And then you, I build the trust with you if I manage to do it right. So I think it's now time for questions. I would like to tell you two more things about that. So, uh, Sandil Return is, of course, a game which should come out hopefully early next year. It's not 2019 anymore. Don't tell anyone. And, but the other thing which I wanted to invite you is uh, our Facebook group, Story Driven Games, where we discuss, without any kind of marketing, uh, stories in games and the ways how we narrate stuff and how other people and their interviews with people from the FMV scene, from adventure game scene. And it's really, it's really interesting group which uh, people, so I invite you there and if you're interested in narration and games, please join us and you can also partake in this discussion. So, time for the questions. You have four minutes for questions. If you have any questions, just raise your hands. I will come to you with a microphone. Oh, uh, thank you for a uh, very interesting speech. Uh, uh, I think uh, there will be a lot of information uh, on your Excel or on your database. So, uh, how did you uh, uh, share with your colleagues uh, working on the narrative part uh, uh, with those uh, a lot of information? Uh, I want to know that. Thank you. Thank you. This was an excellent question. In our case, we are living in a very simple world it's like almost alternative dim dimension from you all because we are just two developers sitting next to each other and we basically when we come with some ideas both of us because uh, basically the uh, the other guy the Lukash is responsible for all the visuals and I'm responsible for programming for scripts but when we talk about the uh, when we talk about the meanings in the game and he for example say okay I would really visually life, uh, like to put some stuff there so we first discuss the meanings and say why, why, why would we, what, and it's always a discussion and you know we work together, I don't know, since 2006 uh, and but before we worked on other, other, in other companies for title, so it's really a long term, long, long term uh, colleague rela relationship in, in, this, in this aspect. So what happens is that we discuss first and Many times happened that we even have a, some sort of argument because he really loved to say and say, but we can't find the meaning for that. And if you can't find the meaning for that, you don't put it there. And then we have like an internal wiki, Wikipedia, where we just put these meanings. We have a section for that, for these meanings. So we have them and we can always cross-reference for, for that. Time, one more question. Okay, so I would like to thank you again for being there. I'm really happy to be, be honored to give you this talk and I hope to see you around and if you want to discuss anything uh, personally, then I'm really free to do it. Thank you. <laughs>